Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Introduction to ITS Networking. My name is Connor, and I will be your moderator. Before we get going on today's webinar, just a few housekeeping things I wanted to run through quickly. All phone lines are muted, so if you have any questions, please use the chat feature within your GoToWebinar toolbar. Presentation will last about 40 minutes or so, which will give us some time for questions at the end. And by attending today's uh, webinar live, you are eligible to earn TARP points through IMSA. For those of you who provided your IMSA number during the registration process, Western Systems will go ahead and handle that submission for you. And lastly, today's webinar will be made available uh, for you to view anytime on demand. You'll get a follow-up email on Thursday with a link to do so. Okay, with the housekeeping, out of the way, I'm excited to introduce today's presenter, Donald Wang, Connected Vehicle and Network Specialist for Western Systems. Donald, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Connor. Well, welcome, everybody, uh, and thank you for joining us on this webinar. I want to talk to you guys about uh, ITS network designs and why some of the uh, features are needed and some of the features probably are not needed and uh, how we choose our solutions to fulfill the needs. So to begin, I want to go through the agenda. Um, well, so we're going to talk about why, who, and what is Ethernet. And as uh, uh, you you will uh, pretty much uh, everybody kind of kind of uh, get get an idea now that everything is Ethernet right now. So we're going to talk about uh, what is the networking fundamentals. Uh, just a little bit uh, going into it. What type of media it uses? How do how do we uh, address each other? And we're going to uh, understand the original concept, so we can understand why it does and what it does in today's uh, switch environment. And we're going to jump into how switch Ethernet works and why today's Ethernet switches allow us to use Ethernet for applications that once were off limit. So we assume that each of you has a general knowledge of uh, digital logic and computer science to the point of understanding the terminology of bits and bytes and the number of systems based on base two, base eight, and base 16. But if you don't know, that's fine. Uh, we're just gonna go through some of the uh, fundamentals and concepts. Hopefully uh, this will make sense to you by the end of the uh, presentation. Okay, so why ethernet? Well, um, Ethernet actually is based on the TCP slash IP protocol, or otherwise known as Internet protocol. Um, it is the rules for communication over the Internet. And it, it is becoming ubiquitous, meaning that it is everywhere. Ever you see, every uh, stuff you touch, every item that you actually send data to at one and of the other, uh, there usually is an Ethernet receiving point. So uh, the devices and clients that uh, are using e e uh, Ethernet today includes cameras, your controllers, any Internet-based applications, or Internet of Things. They are all based on TCP IP protocols. Ethernet is a funda fundamental technology, and in ITS, something similar to uh, Ethernet will be the NTC IP standard. And they are uh, similar in structure and concept. And what is Ethernet? Okay, so to uh, briefly and very, very quickly, it is just a language. Okay, it's a specification for communications link between two machines. The Ethernet specification is managed by the Institutes of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, otherwise known as the IEEE. The specific documents defined in Ethernet standard is IEEE L2.3. The Ethernet specification defines two layers of different aspects of the communication link between two machines or computers. First is the media, or what kind of cable can be used to connect two machines, at what voltage levels, what waveforms, and how are the bits arranged, etc. Second is the rule for communication, which is otherwise known as protocol, such as the addressing scheme, data formats so on and so forth. Every Ethernet device in the world has a unique hardware address assigned by the manufacturer. This is called the media access address or otherwise known as a MAC address. And almost all Ethernet traffic originates and ends at an Ethernet connect connection uh, points governed by the TCP IP protocol. Okay, so um, this 
study of network layers is beyond this course, but it is necessary to mention the subject here because we talk about layer one, layer two Ethernet switches. And we will go into layer three, just maybe just a little bit, but uh, uh, that probably is for another discussion. We will be considering layer one, layer two as defined by the TCP IP protocol suite specification and the Ethernet specification based on I2.4.8.0.3. So layer one defines the media, the voltage levels and bit patterns and so on and so forth. Layer two defines how the media is accessed by each device, the MAC address and the protocol for accessing the media. Layer three is internet protocol, which is IP addressing. Layer four is transmission control protocol, TCP or user datagram protocol, otherwise known as UDP. The layers, this layer established type of connection between two machines. It is a hard connection, uh, TCP that asks for verification of receipts, or is it a soft connection, which is UDP that sends and forgets whether, you know, so it doesn't need a receipt. Layer five is part of the TCP IP stack that manages the connection. This layer determines when to terminate the connection or restart the connection. Layer six may or may not be used. This layer is also part of the, the TCP IP stack and is the main job is to translate the data between two applications if necessary. Layer, layer seven is the application that is using the data being transferred. This may be an email program or a file transfer program. So just kind of briefly go, go over through those, but we're gonna focus on layer one, layer two. Okay, so here's the, uh, the layer one aspects of the, as you can see here, you have the CAT5, CAT6, CAT7 cables, the fiber optic single mode, multi mode, uh, the wireless uh, technologies uh, like Wi Fi, uh, Bluetooth, Stellar, DSRC, or 5G. And here I put copper over here. And this actually is not defined by the Ethernet standard. All right, my watch has just gone out, gone way warm on me. Uh, so copper actually, I put it here so that we can talk about it, but actually this is not part of the Ethernet standard. Um, but uh, aside from the medium, the uh, uh, frame formats is using the Ethernet frame format. So we're gonna talk about that just a little bit as well. So going into the Ethernet media specifications, the original concept uses the, uh, the coax cable uh, that runs around the facility with tax. And then uh, it was quickly evolved into a twisted pair cable. So the wiring scheme could be a star like a phone system. And twisted pair evolved from category three, four, uh, uh, four wires to category five, five E, six, seven, eight with four pairs of wires. The basic difference is the insulation type and twist. And the distance limitation on twisted pair cable is 100 meters. So fiber, and, and then we have the fiber optic cable that's defined, uh, is a defined medium for Ethernet, both on multi-mode and single-mode cable. Fiber optic Ethernet ports are defined as full duplex to a normal fiber optic port uses two, uh, two optical fibers. So in other words, uses two strands, one for TX and one for RX, one for sending, one for receiving. There are also specifications for wavelengths, uh, wavelengths multiplexing ports so that they will be operating using a single fiber cable. So on the uh, fiber media, you're able to send and receive on the same strand of fiber using different colors of lights. The uh, distance of the fiber optic cable is limited by the cable itself or the amount of light that can be transmitted. Okay, so there literally is no limitation on how, how long you can run the fiber optic cable. But generally speaking, on a multi-mode, it is limited to um, about two kilometers at 100 megabits or the 200 meters at one gig. Uh, and that's uh, due to a condition known as modal dispersion. And uh, you don't have to remember all that, but to just know that there are some of the limitations when you are installing your infrastructure. Uh, and single mode fiber optics is, is generally limited in transmission distance by light accumulation, meaning that uh, there's, uh, you know, you don't have enough power to shoot the light through. So, uh, but single mode actually can go miles from here to Hawaii to Japan uh, on the uh, ocean floor. Okay. So while copper media is not defined within the Ethernet framework, it is using the Ethernet standard frames. 
And once the handshaking is achieved via either BDSL2 or GSH DSL, uh, then they began com communicating uh, using the Ethernet frame. So BDSL2 is up to 1.2 kilometers and up to 80 megabits per second. And GSH DSL is with pair bonding, you can be uh, you can run for miles, and that based on the signal to noise ratio. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about addressing really quickly, and then we're going to talk into the uh, the fun stuff. So this is just kind of for information only. Um, the Ethernet defines a protocol that is built around the MAC address. Hardware addressing is assigned to every Ethernet device. The MAC address is a 48-bit number, which yields a total of 2.81 times 10 to the 14 addresses. So that's a lot of addresses you can define with the MAC address. Now, that's a lot of addresses, so it's not... Uh, something that you you know that we can use to to route anything uh, just so for your information the first 24 bits are the fixed number that is assigned to the vendor as an identifier and then there are two um um and and then there are the, the numbers that follows basically will be kind of like a serial number or it's, uh, it's just randomly assigned addresses so there are two unique mac addresses uh, one of them is a broadcast which is you send to everybody and then the second one is, is known as a multicast. Uh, and that's a dif differentiated on the, on the second bit. So the multicast is a special set of MAC addresses that has to be set aside for designation as multicast. And then uh, we, we'll explain that just a little bit later. Okay, so here's a little bit of a history. The original Ethernet design was a network of computers all connected to one coax cable. And uh, there's obvious limitations in that only one computer can be can be talking at any single time, and everybody else has to be listening because they follow rules and you know they're they're polite people. So when somebody is talking, you don't talk, and that's how it was originally designed. Um, but there is a problem with that because um, what if in the uh, in in real human scenarios like uh, what we have here, we have a moderator that actually says, "Sir, you're up." Oh, sir, now it's your turn. You have a moderator that can actually tell you when to speak and when not to speak. But on the original topology, there's no moderator. So what happened is that you have a situation where you have, well, uh, we're talking and then we're listening. And then if we both talk at the same time, then we back off and then we try it again to see if, if uh, one of them uh, actually beats the other by talking first. So it becomes a little chaotic. So the original um, concept as a, a what's known as a um, collision uh, CSMA CD that that actually was designed to actually deal with that uh, collision. Uh, so that's CSMA CD stands for carrier sense multiple access and collision detection. Uh, so that allows the uh, uh, the devices to talk when there's a collision. They back off and then they try to talk again. So that's uh, we don't have uh, noises or on the uh, not unclear communications between each other. But um, um, the original concept is a scenario where you go listen, talk, if you collision, you back up, and then you try again. Okay. So here's what we do as we evolve when, when it becomes a, a packet communication scenario. Ethernet is a pack, com pack communications opposed to circuit communications. So uh, just kind of differentiate between the two. Uh, circuit communication means that you have a dedicated pack. Packet communication means that, well, you have a best case scenario. So the uh, put it in a little bit more the easier to understand way. Circuit communication is like you you uh, you get on a train. And then it has a dedicated rail, so it follows the schedule, and that there is no collisions. You have your own path. Packet communication is like a taxi cab at New York City or anywhere else. I, I don't know where else you can get taxis, but uh, uh, if you ever take a cab in New York, then uh, you know they, they don't always go on the same route because they're trying to find the best way to get to your destination. But both uh, ways, Gets to your destination, but uh, when you have a circuit uh, circuit based communication, you have a dedicated path. Whereas Ethernet is a packet based communication, so it's going to look for uh, the the least congested way to get there. Okay, so um, 
the packets here is generated with a source address and a destination address and the payload of data. And uh, the network equipment, such as a switch and routers, will direct this packets to its destination. Okay, so let's see. The switch is actually the next next uh, involvement of the uh, uh, of the network, and this is right now we're talking about just a regular unmanaged switch. Uh, sometimes we uh, call this the thumb switch. Okay, so uh, and then uh, the the one that's not dumb we call it smart, you know, for obvious reasons. And then we have a managed switch. So uh, just kind of a, a joke here. If you uh, don't want to be mean and uh, you feel like you're talking to somebody who's not so smart, you can say that this person is unmanaged. So there it is. So the Ethernet switch was a major development for network communications. In uh, The switch now allows any two computers to communicate with each other without interfering with any other computer on the network. So in other words, the, before we had a collision and then we have to back up now with the switch, we don't have that anymore. Um, so the switch doesn't actually uh, switch, but it it's, uh, gives the illusion that it's switching. It's actually creating a table of MAC address and port numbers within itself of every device that is connected to. So, um, in simple terms, when you receive something from a switch port, it reads the, uh, where, uh, where it needs to go, and then based on this table, and then forwards to that to, uh, to the destination uh, where it was registered. And how that is uh, registered actually is by means of a broadcast. So um, broadcast is something that is required within the Ethernet framework. When you plug something in into a port, uh, the device that's plugged in sends a broadcast, and the device that's plugged in sends a broadcast, so that we populate the table, so we know who's actually getting on this port, who's getting on that port. Okay. So now the switches can talk to each other without uh, interfering with each other. Okay. Um, the Ethernet switch is a basic network elements in Ethernet networks of today. So let's uh, look at the operation a little bit more in detail. So um, every device in the modern uh, network is connected to a switch somehow, one way or the other. And then they are required to send out, send out the packets periodically uh, that, that we just talked about, which is called the broadcast, so that we can remember uh, where who this person is and who the other um, uh, where the destination is going to go. So the switch remembers all the MAC addresses that has come into association with that device itself. And typically, a switch can hold about four thousand addresses, and then it learns the uh, the uh, learns to store the uh, the source address and the ports on the table, otherwise known as the MAC address table, and then uh, it does the store and forwarding to the appropriate ports based on the address uh, destination. So this there is a limitation to this. Okay, we get a a lot of broadcasts, and then uh, uh, some of the guys they fall into sleep. Some of the guys they leave the network. So um, for the switch to actually make it uh, dynamic, they have to forget all the addresses every once in a while. So typically it's a three hundred second uh, time frame. You know, otherwise known as the fish story from finding Dory that has short-term memory is uh, uh, has to remember everybody else again after five minutes. So uh, in other words, you can expect broadcast to happen every five minutes on each single device when you uh, leave uh, the aging of the, um, the MAC table at 300 seconds. Okay, you can obviously change that number, but then uh, uh, you run the risk of missing the devices that actually has left the work now at the network and then takes up another residence on the Mac table or you have too much broadcast going on. Okay, so this is the standard switch behavior. And then uh, we are we actually have a, a way to actually solve this. Okay, this is uh, just the topology of the basic uh, network. Uh, here you have three switches that they're connected to each other. And there's a few different clients that's connected to each switch. 
So if you notice that there is a communication path for any machine to communicate with any other machine. Um, one more thing about uh, TCP IP networks is that when the machine is turned on and uses the uh, TCP IP protocol, it always sends out the broadcast. Well, we already talked about that, okay, to tell that it's, it's there. But once you leave, um, the machine doesn't forget you right away because there's an aging limit uh, that is set up. So once that aging limit is reached, once that number is reached, then actually flushes all the table. Okay, so here's the Ethernet frame. And uh, this is to, in order to understand how the uh, network and internet switches uh, do what they do, here is, we have to understand the relationship and how it relates to TCP IP. So um, I don't really want to go into too much detail on this, but uh, if you uh, have any questions on how this actually is assembled, uh, feel free to ask us. But uh, this is how, just kind of to show you, this is the MAC address here. And the IP header actually is in the payload. Okay, so, and then the layers is la uh, layer one, layer two here, and then layer three, layer four to seven. They're all actually in the payload. Okay. So we have uh, three modes of uh, communication. Um, There is a uh, addressing is uh, we have a unicast, which is a uh, point to point. We have a broadcast, which is one to everybody. And then we have a multicast, which is one to uh, many, but uh, uh, only on the ones that are selected. Okay. And I want to go through power of the Ethernet uh, just uh, briefly, because um, um, what this does is that it allows the installation of, say, cameras, roadside units, radio communication equipment, et cetera, with just a single wire on the ethernet cable without the need to pull another power cable to uh, up to the pole or up to the luminaire. So this uh, makes it uh, um, very, very clutter free. And also because this is a standard, anything that supports PoE uh, could be mounted without running a different power cable specific for that device. So this actually is one of the things that uh, um, I think uh, in today's uh, ideas world is it is very useful. It has a lot of benefits. Okay, and then um, the features we talk about has been um, just to the switches. Um, the standard switches otherwise known as the unmanaged or dumb switches, but so we have a even more efficient switch called the managed switch. So on the unmanaged switch, there's no MAC address, no IP address. Uh, it's plug and play. There's no setup required. And it performs the basic switching functions, uh, creates a MAC port table, and that's going forward. Okay. And it has auto detection for speed, MDI, MDIX, which basically is a crossover cable. Uh, half and full duplex and has flow control. Okay. Now on the improvement of the managed switch, we have the managed switch has its own MAC address, has an IP configuration, and becomes a network element. Other uh, other words becomes visible, and it allows uh, for remote configuration. Okay, and allows for remote monitoring, and can give you reports and with a lot of added functionalities. And there are different ways to manage it. You can use uh, direct access, which is console, or remote access via the, net the network itself. Okay, so the uh, uh, ways to manage remotely, you could uh, use a web browser, you could use a command line, you can use uh, a telnet, or you can use a simple network management protocol, which actually uh, is using the uh, management information base, otherwise known as MIPS. I think uh, uh, most of you have put probably pretty familiar with what a MIB is. So it just allows a software, a third-party software that supports compiling the MIBs to actually manage all the network devices that supports the simple network management protocol. Okay, so the major features of a um, managed switch for ITS. So I just want to talk about three. 
So the first one is uh, span issue protocol, which uh, covers STP, RSTP, and even MSTP, and VLAN, which stands for Virtual Local Area Network, and IGMP Zooming, that actually has to do with uh, video distribution uh, management. Okay, so why spanning tree? Why is spanning tree important for ITS? Well, I got three words for you. Redundancy, redundancy, and redundancy. Well, actually that's four words, right? But okay. Well, so spanning tree is a redundancy protocol. How do we create redundancy? Is by, we, we create redundancy by creating a loop or sometimes we uh, refer them to be, uh, to be a ring or many rings. But ethernet cannot operate in a ring or a loop. Okay, so the network will self-destruct because of the way broadcast packets are forwarded to each port on the switch. If the network is in a loop or a broadcast packet will duplicate itself every time it's tra a traverse the loop and it will soon cause the network to be consumed by broadcast packets. So just kind of give you an idea, the uh, normal latency between a switch to do so and forwarding is four nanoseconds. So how quickly do you think network is gonna go down when you have a loop that's not protected without spanning to turn on? Well, it breaks down before you can unplug the cable and then it kills everybody in its path. It's a tornado. It's uh, uh, like a category, what's the biggest one? I don't remember. Anyway, so here's how spanning to operates. As you can see, broadcast enters in and it goes in both directions. Right, and that's what we call a broadcast storm. So now you're doomed. Nobody's talking because you're all everybody's overwhelmed with all sorts of broadcasts that repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself. So how does uh, Spanish tree solve this? Okay, so what happened is that uh, Spanish tree before it turns. Uh, allows every, any, any traffic to pass, sends out uh, what's known as a bridge protocol data units or BPTU packets. So everybody learns uh, where each other are based on where the, uh, the, uh, the roots of the tree is defined. So it finds its way in the path and then uh, disable one of the ports electronically so that you don't have a, phys you don't have a uh, electronic loop. You have a physical loop, but electronically one of the ports is turned off so you don't have a, a loop or a, a ring going on electronically. And as soon as you have a network disruption, that port turns back on. That's how you have redundancy in the simplest terms. So if you see how this can map to your network, imagine if you, each one of those locations, each one of those switches is one of the intersections within the city, and now you have conduits that goes kind of like in the, in the loop, like this. This is the, the, the most ideal situation that you can have for a spanning tree, uh, meaning that so if you get uh, somebody cut this conduit, you still have backup conduit locations where you can send the uh, data back. Okay, and the next major feature I want to talk to you about is uh, VLANs. And it's based on the i 24 q standard. Um, this is a way to separate different departments, if you will, or different kinds of network traffic um, to, uh, to its own domain. So there is uh, some of the fundamental, there's a default VLAN, which is uh, normally one, but it could be modified for more security. And the uh, information or data is only switched or passed between devices of the same VLAN or on the same network. Uh, an example of how this could be useful is uh, like peer-to-peer -peer broadcast when you have a peer-to-peer -peer or local adaptive setup on the controllers. Um, you could actually just set up a, a, a segment of your location so they're on the same network and they can just broadcast amongst themselves without actually worry about the other controllers seeing one of those broadcasts and begin trigger a call or something to that effect. And it also improves the cluster management because you can now group different uh, locations within the city into their own networks. And that's if you want to make a change, say for example, to one section of the city only, then you just click that cluster and then you can just apply to that VLAN only, okay? Um, and the one of the biggest benefits is that re it reduces the unnecessary broadcast traffic that goes in between devices. 
Now, keep in mind, we talk about whenever you plug something in onto the switch or onto any of the ports or onto any of the radios, it sends a broadcast. You know, so um, while the switches and uh, the personal computers and PCs, they're they're fine with broadcasts. Not everybody likes broadcasts, especially the ones that need controllers. Talk to the ones that control see how they like it. You know, so it wasn't designed to take this much amount of broadcast broadcast from everybody, especially when you can legally allow 4,000 devices on the same network. You know, so, and uh, just keep in mind, a broadcast is somebody talking with a loudspeaker. So if you have 4,000 loudspeakers, that's no good. So we definitely want to minimize the number of loudspeakers within the domain itself. So VLAN achieves that. Um, and also we, uh, this could be a security measure as well because uh, VLANs, when the ones that are created within the switch, they're not visible to each other. The only way you can talk to another device on a different network is that you have to go through a router, otherwise known as a gateway. And so um, it adds, a little, adds more security for different uh, services, uh, especially when you have like a video camera that sends out a lot of uh, information or a lot, a lot of bandwidth, uses all the bandwidth and traffic uh, within your network. You, you definitely don't want those to hit your controllers. So when you create a VLAN, it protects the controller from seeing the case where uh, the video camera decides to go, I'm just going to send to everybody. You know, this happens every once in a while, and there's a reason why it does that. Okay. So a VLAN will help you uh, to control your network so that you are the mitigating the, uh, the size of the domain so that it uh, contains a broadcast domain and that uh, um, you could actually create purposely built VLANs so that uh, for special services such as peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay, so the next one is just a simple illustration of how VLAN is uh, uh, illustrated. So you can see VLAN 1 is the default VLAN. VLAN 2 is configured for the ports 1 and 2. Um, 1, 2, and 3, sorry. And VLAN 3 is configured for port 4, 5, and 6. So basically, this uh, switch is separated into uh, three different switches because you have VLAN 1, 2, and 3. So even though they're, they're residing on the same physical switch, now VLAN 2 and VLAN 3, they're actually not going to be able to talk to each other. And um, VLAN 1 actually will be on uh, port 7 and 8. And we're also going to designate VLAN 1 as something, uh, as a trunk or a tag VLAN, OK? So how do we uh, send VLANs across uh, switches? The I2POE ALS.1Q uh, specification requires that a switch is able to generate VLAN tags on the Ethernet package, known as the one q tag. And this allows us to configure some of the ports as quote unquote trunk ports or you know or uplink downlink ports that are members of multiple VLANs. And uh, the trunk ports transports the tag frame, the tag VLAN packets between them. And um, if you see in this illustration, you have uh, VLAN two across the network between switch one and switch two, and all the machines connected to VLAN two can communicate with each other but no other devices. Okay, so, uh, and this is separated by the different colors, which you can see VLAN 2 and VLAN 2. So this actually is the same switch, and this actually is a different switch. So you can create a virtual domain, even though the switches are physically located in different locations. Okay. And so the next feature in ITS networking is what we know what is known as a multicast. And in layer two, it's called IGMP and um, stands for Internet Group Management Protocol. And it's a way to send one packet or one payload from one machine to many other machines, um, but uh, not, not to everybody, not like a broadcast, but you can send it to a lot more or to many different devices, but just not to everybody. Because broadcast, remember, sends the data to everybody, whether you like it or not. Uh, multicast sends the data to many different devices, but only because you want it. Okay. So on the, uh, it's a special set of IP addresses and MAC addresses, 
and it allows multiple, multiple devices to receive the same packets without duplicating the packets on the network. Okay, um, what does that mean? It means that uh, if you are allocating the uh, video payload or from the cameras to be a multicast packet, you could actually duplicate, duplicate those video sessions without a server duplicating the sessions for you. Okay, more into that a little bit later. Okay, so on the layer three, we have what's known as a uh, PIM or protocol independent multicast. It piggybacks on the routing protocol and it's routing protocol agnostic. So it doesn't matter what you're using on the router side, but it piggybacks on the routing table. And um, layer two is uh, what known as the Internet Group Management Protocol or IGMP. And um, Routers drops all multicast packets onto your device as you join the group. Okay, so to do actually multicast within the layer two uh, network, you actually need a layer three switch somewhere in the midst of your network. Okay, uh, this is actually the uh, true as well for VLANs because if you want to uh, traverse between different VLANs, you need, you actually need a gateway or a router that actually is able to route those two different networks. Okay. So here's a, a little bit more information on how IGMP snooping works. So um, IGMP snooping allows the layer two switch to snoop into layer three packets and determine if a packet contains an IGMP command or query, okay? Uh, and it allows the layer two switch to recognize a multicast address and store and forward packets based on multicast addresses. So it becomes one of the uh, normal MAC addresses within the MAC address table. And the router with IGMP manages the multicast packets by sending out queries that ask machines to respond if they want to receive specific multicast groups or addresses. And if a machine responds with a join command, then the router and the switch in the network will forward the multicast packets or the video stream with the address to that specific device that requested it. So if you ask for a join, you get it. If you ask for a leave, then that session is terminated for you. Okay. The benefits of this is, is that the camera only needs to send one signal and that uh, signal is duplicated by the network itself. So it does not require a server or additional device to duplicate a secondary stream or a third stream or a fourth stream. Okay, so here's a brief illustration of what uh, an IP unicast look like. So you have a computer here that is requesting for information from the server. So what happened is that uh, the server sends out that uh, information to that client, but then you have a second computer that asking for the same stream. What happened in the unicast scenario is that, well, now the server has to send two separate, another stream to the second computer. So what happened with that is that uh, not only do you need a more powerful device such as server to actually duplicate that stream, you also double the bandwidth requirements within your network here at the, at the server end, okay? And then you have a third device and you can see the server now is uh, working that much harder by sending a third stream to that third client and so on and so forth, okay? So in the IP multicast setup without the, um, the IGMP snooping enable on these switches, um, the server, sends out uh, uh, the stream to the router. The, the one that's behind the uh, the server, that's a circle, that's the router. The, the ones that square are the switches, okay? So you have the same scenario where the uh, this client wants to see that video stream. Well, the um, router sends a stream to that switch, but if you can see over here, um, the, uh, the the computer that's next to the uh, computer that was that wants to see the stream also gets it because the layer two switch is not set up with IGMP snooping. Okay, but the um, the yellow arrow actually is just a uh, basically a, a query that the router sends. Okay, and then you see uh, another device or another computer that wants to see the same stream. The router sends the uh, the video stream along to the switch. And the switch, because IGMP snooping is not turned on, sends it to both uh, computers that's attached to it. But if you uh, focus back on the server side, 
the server still only needs to send out one stream. It doesn't need to send out multiple sessions like before. Okay, now with IGMP snooping turned on on the managed switch, here's what happens. Okay, the router sends out queries. So now everybody learns who, who the query or who actually is the owner of all the uh, video streams. And so the server still sends out that video stream to the router and the router keeps that in this table and doesn't send it to anybody else. And then you have one device on the top left that wants to, uh, to uh, get that video session. So the router sends that to the switch and the switch because IGMP snooping is turned on only sends to the one that requested that video stream. So as you can see, the other computer does not need to get it. Okay. And then you have a second computer that wants to uh, see that uh, stream as well. The router sends it along to the uh, local switch and the local switch sends it to uh, the client. And then you have the third one that wants to see the same thing. So guess what? That local switch already has that. So it just uh, sends it along to another client as well without asking for another session from the router. Okay, so in the CCTV system, we assume that each camera is sending a multicast video. Okay, so this is how we do bandwidth calculation. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the yellow packet is uh, designated as a multicast query. So that's just a kind of like a broadcast. And then you have different videos sending out different colors of arrows and those are the video streams. So what happened here is that you can see that uh, bandwidth is only going to increase as it goes toward the router. And that's the total amount of bandwidth you will need for that for that CCTV system. Okay, so let's say um, this uh, computer down here wants to see the, uh, the camera that's on the top right. So what happened is that the router already has everything. So nothing changes on the bandwidth on the stream that's on the other side of the router. The router just sends that to the client itself. Okay. So to sum it up, managed versus unmanaged switches. So common reasons for using the managed switch is that well, we want to separate different devices together. We need to use VLANs. We would like to have some redundancy. We like to have some the multicast capability, and we want to know how our network is doing by receiving alarms. And or if your network is physically large, you know, and that uh, you want to be able to do uh, cluster management. Um, so to sum it up, uh, for ITS networks, please choose managed switches. And uh, Western Systems offers anything that you actually guys need to fill in the blank. So if you have questions on how, you know, what to choose, what uh, uh, mediums you have, and what's the best way to actually leverage that medium, talk to us and we'll figure it out for you. Okay, that's it. All right, thanks, Donald. Uh, we'll get going on the Q&A process. So if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and use the chat feature within your GoToWebinar toolbar and, and we'll get to those. We did have a few come in while you were speaking, Donald. So the first one for you is, do you have solutions to serve existing copper but can be upgraded to fiber when that becomes available for the city? Oh, that's a very good question. Thank you, Connor. Um, yeah, we do. So we have actually solutions from both uh, Rugacom and uh, at Palace. And that uh, uh, which one to choose really depends on what you, what type of uh, copper you have right now and, and how long the run is going to go. So both of those uh, products, they actually offer what's known as a small form pluggable port. So uh, you could, right now, if you have copper, you can use the copper ports. That's actually uh, already there on the switch. And when you upgrade your infrastructure to fiber, basically all that you need is you just need to uh, get the fiber module plug into the switch and then plug the fiber cable that's terminated into that SFP and then off you go. So uh, you don't have to uh, switch any equipment. Great, next one for you uh, is quality of service uh, a necessity for ITS. Can you uh, elaborate on that? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I didn't talk about quality of service, but uh, looks like we got some uh, seasoned people over here. So quality of service actually is a way to um, prioritize packets or prioritize traffic when you actually have congestion. So uh, just the, the background of it is that um, if you have a freeway system, say if you're the, your connection is similar to a freeway and then you have the 405 freeway in LA that's always congested, uh, then you, you want to allocate certain number of uh, vehicles that has higher priority by putting them onto a separate lane, like the, uh, the toll lane or the carpool lane. So that's basically the idea behind quality of service. In ITS network, uh, when quality of service is required is really when you have not uh, done proper bandwidth calculation requirements. Uh, so if that's the thing, then um, the easiest way actually is not to go configure the toss bits and the, uh, the queue ways of the QoS profile, but the easier way is actually just to get the right switch at the first time around. So get a switch that has one gig or even 10 gig, uh, so you will never run on the bandwidth. And that way you can serve everybody because in the ITS network, the priority, believe it or not, is not on the high bandwidth requirements, which actually comes from video cameras. The priority is for the uh, traffic controllers that actually just actually uses a, a much smaller amount of bandwidth. So QoS is useful when you are in the telecom world uh, because you have a lot of clients that is trying to oversubscribe your line or trying to overwhelm that link. But in ITS, it's easily managed, uh, managed easily enough to manage with a higher bandwidth switch, which is actually, actually is widely available now. But that being said, QoS is still available on the managed switches if you choose to use it. Uh, it's just that uh, we hope that in the ITS network that never becomes a scenario. Hope that answered the question. Great, and then looks like the last one here for you, Donald. Um, having a separate con having a separate conduit available for redundancy is not always possible. Is there a way to still get redundancy when all intersections are sharing the same conduit for fiber? Yes, there is. Okay, and that's also uh, I think I believe that is uh, a very real scenario as well. Uh, ideally, of course, we would like to uh, have the backup link on a separate conduit so that if you have construction going on on the road, when somebody accidentally digs to your conduit, uh, you would have a backup somewhere else, physically, uh, you know, different real estates, right? So you can actually have that backup. But uh, um, when that's not available, what you can do is, and I don't have the diagram here, you can do what's known as a uh, collapse ring. So you can alternate the fiber strength within the um, um, the conduits, the different strands of fiber, and you could still have redundancy that way. Uh, that uh, will have everybody connected on different strands of fiber. It forms a, a ring, but they are collapsing to the same conduits. Now, it does this does not protect you from somebody digging to the conduits, but it does protect you uh, when somebody you know, take out like a cabinet and take out that switch along the line because it will only take out that switch, but you will still have the fiber uh, within the conduit that still provides communication to the other devices down the line. So a simple answer is yes. Just we got to look at your fiber plans and figure out which ones to actually use. Great. Thanks, Donald. That looks like all the questions we got today. So thank you everyone for attending and have a great afternoon. Well, thank you very much.